it's nice to be here. Um, it's nice to meet uh, all of you. I hope we get some time in the Q&A to interact. So the title of my talk today is Akibia, the most temporal passion. And it's phrased in the form of a question mark because I'm actually uh, playing devil's advocate with myself and some statements that I made in the book that, that Father Jeffrey just mentioned. So I'm gonna start uh, the presentation with a quotation from that book. And I'm just gonna throw us right in the middle of the quotation. Over the course of the presentation, I'll explain some of the terms that come up and things like that. But, um, you know, sometimes it's nice to just get right into the thick of it. So there's a quotation in my book, which by the way, I've brought a few copies with me in case you would like to buy them. <coughs> Cheaper to buy them from me than to order them online and pay for shipping. And um, I'll, I'll pass a copy around if you just want to look at it. I'm also going to pass around, sorry, I'm staying, in, staying in the window. I'm also going to pass around um, a Lenten study and reflection guide that I made last year for Lent. And you can download this for free on the Ancient Faith site. If you look up my book on the Ancient Faith site, it's a free PDF. I'm going to pass this around to look at because who doesn't like reading a good book during Lent? <laughs> Okay, so in, in this book, I make a claim, and I say that despondency, or uh, what, what in ancient ascetical theology was termed akivia in the Greek, I'll talk a bit more about that term, despondency is the most temporal of the spiritual passions. It is the only one associated with a particular time of day. References to the noonday demon are at least as old as the Psalms. Evagrius observed, I'll explain who Evagrius was later, Evagrius observed that this passion most frequently attacks from about the fourth hour until the ninth. I was excited when I saw the time of this lecture because I was like, it's, it's just outside of that window, we'll be fine. <laughs> um, it's what, 3.30 in real time if you're watching this at some later point on the internet. You know, so, and then I go on and I say, in a wider sense, Despondency epitomizes how sin and brokenness feed and are fed by a fragmented antagonistic relationship to temporality. So this quotation, and I, uh, elude, I omitted a bunch of text in the middle. I kind of explain this in a bit more detail in the book itself. But um, this is basically the premise of my book, namely that the spiritual sickness of despondency is somehow integral to or, or intertwined with our relationship to time as human beings. And because of that, I kind of refer to it as, as the most temporal um, of the sort of archetypal spiritual passions you often hear referenced in Eastern Christian theology, you know, gluttony, lust, uh, anger. Um, so despondency is, is very much tied to our experience of time. And likewise, healing from despondency involves redeeming or healing our relationship to time, specifically the present moment. I'll unpack this all a bit later, but basically what I wanted to do for this talk is revisit that premise, because I think as thinkers or as students or even just as human beings, it's a useful exercise every once in a while to go back to things you've written or thought at a previous point in time and um, re-examine it and decide, you know, what would I have said differently? Or what would I have added? How would I have nuanced that differently, knowing what I know now? Because we're, we're learning every day, right? So I'm going to sort of add some further nuance that, you know, if I were to add to, uh, I, I would do that today. My guiding questions in this talk are, is despondency really the most temporal passion? Um, what is the connection between time and the passions generally? By passions, I mean the sort of evil thoughts, the logismi that confront us in our spiritual lives. So what is the connection between time and these passions according to Evagrius of Ponticus, um, a fourth century uh, ascetical theologian? I'll explain who he is in a, in a second. And thirdly, why, is this, why are these questions important to our understandings of the spiritual life? The main text, once we get into the part of the talk where I'm looking at um, primary sources, the main text that I'm going to look at is a treatise from Evagrius called the Practicos, 
And um, I, there, I think there's a few, one or two quotes from a few other of his aesthetical writings, but for the most part, it's all from the practicals. This was a treatise who that was intended for monks in kind of a middle phase of the monastic life. They'd already left the city and entered the desert, but they weren't yet, you know, fully matured. They hadn't yet attained apathia or sort of the full measure of spiritual stature in the monastic life. And so this was a highly practical pastoral work intended to, to give them some tools to counter their passions and temptations. Who was Evagrius of Ponticus? And I have the IC in parentheses because you sometimes hear him referred to as Evagrius of Pontus, other times as Ponticus. As far as I understand, these are just spelling variations uh, of the region of, of Pontus. He lived in the fourth century. He was active in Constantinople, Jerusalem, the Nitrian Desert in Egypt, and Kelia, also a desert area. Who's heard of Evagrius before this? So most people have at least <coughs> heard of him. Um, I'm not going to give you a full biography, just to give you some reference points uh, his, in terms of his what I call his claims to fame. He was a student of St. Basil, who I believe ordained him to the diaconate, as well as Gregory of Nazianzus, Macarius of Egypt, and um, he also had contact with Melania the Elder. He t went on to teach St. John Cassian. Uh, he was posthumously accused of the doctrine of believing and writing about the doctrine of restitution, um, as as often happens, you kind of get a number of theologians at this time kind of got tied up with originism. Um, now a lot of this is is problematized. It's not really as big of a deal anymore. But because he was accused of this doctrine, a lot of his more speculative theological writings have been destroyed or lost to history. What we do have from him, we do still have some of his theological writings, but the majority of what we have and what he's most famous for are his ascetical writings, um, of which the practicos is one. Many of his sayings of his, from his ascetical writings were included in the Philokalia. And I think what makes Evagoras really special is he's often nicknamed the father of psychotherapy. And uh, I don't mean modern Freudian psychotherapy, of course, but Christian notions of care for the soul. And uh, we're going to see that he invested a huge amount of energy into observing the sort of progression of spiritual sickness um, how thoughts and temptations afflict us, what they do, how they play out in time. And sort of his big achievement was in what he's most well known for is he categorized what we now refer to as the eight deadly thoughts. What were these eight deadly thoughts? Well, again, thoughts in this context, I'm thinking of the Greek word logismi. And this, uh, this has um, importance in sort of practical theology, logismi are the kind of thoughts that occur to us as neutral in the beginning, but when we begin to cooperate them can go on to cause spiritual destruction. So I'm going to give an example of a logismos just for clarification. If someone gives you a compliment and um, you think about that compliment, oh, they gave me a compliment and you're, you're kind of thinking back on it. Well, that's, that's a neutral thought. It's a thought that's occurring to your mind. And according to Evagrius and a lot of others in our tradition, that is not yet a sin. It's not yet pride. This is just what the mind does is have thoughts. But the more you start listening to that thought and the more you start cooperating with it, you eventually start to puff up if, if we're talking about prideful thoughts. Um, and that can become a whole mentality you can then begin to see yourself, you know, and your worth through the lens of these compliments that you get. That becomes this whole prideful way of life. And there's kind of this spectrum. The more you act out of that pride or sin, the more that becomes entwined with your way of life. And it becomes almost a habit and more difficult to break, um, which you kind of get into the realm of a passion. A passion is something you really struggle with, something you struggle to kind of... <clears throat> 
cleanse your mind from, cleanse your life from. So Evagrius categorized all of the many sins or, or forms of temptation that can uh, attack us into eight categories, and they're listed here. Gluttony, lust, uh, avarice, which we don't use that word a lot. It's basically greed specifically for money or wealth, dejection or sadness, anger, uh, despondency or akivia, which obviously I'll be, I'll be talking a bit more about, vainglory, another word we don't use a lot today, although in the age of social media we may uh, want to start thinking more about this ancient passion. I've kind of put some modern synonyms. I think we could, we could call it vainglory ambition or self-display. Um, and then pride. Uh, so these were the eight categories, the eight evil thoughts. Eventually, through St. John Cassian, they would find their way to Leo the Great, who would reconsolidate these thoughts under the guise of the seven deadly sins. Um, and he did that in part by joining despondency and dejection uh, into one sin called sloth. He also did some other things, but that's, that's one of the ways he adapted this framework. Um, it's not that these eight evil thoughts are somehow canonical or the gospel truth. They're, they're not even the only framework that Eastern Christian writers have used to categorize sin over the many centuries of our tradition. Um, but the use of these frameworks allow us, it, it aids our recognition, basically, of sins. So there could be other, you know, side, side sins to these or, or tangential sins that maybe aren't quite captured by this framework. But the real value this gives us is we can look at this and be like, oh, and ask ourselves, when have I been prideful? When have I, um, you know, experienced sadness or what have you? Now, another thing I just want to mention about this framework is that, uh, and another thing Evagrius is known for, is he had a highly complex way of envisioning the relationships between all of these passions. So uh, if you read his ascetical writings, you'll notice he's, He'll, he'll say, what causes despondency? Well, anger and desire. So there's some of these passions are more primary than others. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll share a quote from him later in the presentation where he encourages individuals to pay attention to the way that passions relate to one another within themselves, the relationships that form. You know, when you get angry, does that fuel sadness within you or... Does that fuel pride? You can kind of go in a lot of different directions once one passion attacks you. So I'm going to focus in a bit on despondency just to give you a clear concept of what it is because I think we often look at these terms and assume we know, well, yeah, I know what pride is or I know what anger is. But then you go and read someone like Evagrius and see how they actually defined it and you realize, oh, there's there's nuances and there's a depth here that I don't, you know, I've never stopped to consider. So I'll focus in a bit on despondency, but um, I'm going to come back to almost all of these passions in the duration of my talk at some point. So what is despondency? And I, I do think that of the passions we've just mentioned, despondency is probably the most complex. Um, it's complex for a few different reasons. Uh, partly because it, it can cause a lot of symptoms. Anyway, we'll, we'll get there. Despondency, the word that I use in English, is not a direct, you know, etymo it's not etymologically direct from the Greek term that Evagrius would have used, which is akivia, um, which is made of, of two roots. One is a, means a lack of and care. So basically what akivia uh, literally means is, is apathy or carelessness. Um, not, not apathia, so not, not the state of being that, you know, the fathers and, and Evagrius himself call us to, which apathia is a uh, passionlessness, pa passionlessness, yes, all the syllables. Um, and that is the state of being in which you can maintain tranquility in the face of the passions. So you still have these neutral 
thoughts. These thoughts still might occur to you, but you don't cooperate with them. They don't jostle your ship. They don't, they don't uh, disturb the ship of your soul. You keep sailing a straight course. That's apathia. This kind of apathy is an apathy towards things you should actually care about. So you stop caring particularly about prayer and um, the ascetic effort, ascetical effort. It's alternatively described as an unnatural slackness or atonia of the soul. Um, and we actually, even in medical contexts today, you'll hear in like te technical medical terminology, atonia is associated with conditions um, that in which the muscles begin to atrophy or lose their tone. And so you can, uh, can imagine in your soul, if you've experienced times where you, you feel connected to the spiritual life, you're going through the labor, you're taking on the labor, you're taking up your cross, you know, to the best of your ability maybe in that moment, there's a tension there. It's a, it's a tension, it's a vigilance. And when that, when you counter that with times in your spiritual life where you're not focused or you don't really care, you can feel inside of yourself a kind of looseness where things just slip through, you're not really paying attention, um, you just don't really care in the same way as you might in times when you're more focused for whatever reasons. And uh, despondency is that looseness. I think in my book I say something like, you know, like a belt that has grown loose with time, despondency slackens our, in despondency our souls become slack and, and cease to hold us up in this spiritual effort that we're supposed to be engaged in, in Christ. So on the outside, what does this look like in practical terms? Well, here's where it kind of gets complex because on the one hand, it can look like fatigue, um, lethargy. I'm not talking when you're sick and you have a cold and you're tired. I'm talking about when you're just bored and you don't care. So I'm just going to lay on the couch and watch Netflix or whatever. <laughs> But on the other hand, it can cause anxiety. <laughs> Evagrius talks about monks walking, like pacing circles in their, in their cells, um, or so kind of caught up in this restlessness that they've got to walk all the way over across the desert to where their other brother, nearest brother monk is and pay them a visit, right? They, they just can't sit still. Um, so there's kind of two faces. There's like a slowing down face and a speeding up face, but ultimately it's coming from the same energy which is this apathy. And you might have guessed time and despondency. As I mentioned, I, I explore this relationship with time and how I see this is an antagonism towards the present moment. The monks have this, this present moment, whatever it consists of. It might consist of prayer, depending on the time of day. It might consist of manual labor. It might consist of reading a book. Vegas talks a lot about um, book reading and how despondency often attacks when you're reading a book. We can all relate to that in this room probably a lot of us are academics um so whatever the present moment is despondency says i want to do something else i don't want to be here um if it's time for prayer i want to be sleeping if it's time for sleeping i want to be off gallivanting visiting my monks if i if the present moment is staying in the monastery i want to be off in the city where i came from visiting my family so whatever the present moment consists of, despondency sort of tempts the monk out of that moment or that circumstance. What are the precursors? I, I said before there's kind of a, always a progression with, with Evagrius. Passions don't just come out of nowhere. They usually come from another passion. Well, for Evagrius, despondency comes from uh, sort of this twofold energy shared between anger you're angry at what you have or what is present. You're angry at what the present moment consists of for you. And you also desire what you don't have. And I put uh, avarice in parentheses. Not be, I, I kind of am putting words in Evagrius' mouth. He doesn't actually say it's avarice or greed for something else. He uses a different word. But I see a lot of similarities between this kind of desire you're you're always yearning for what you don't have or what you see around you that, that you could 
you know, the grass is always greener on the other side of the street kind of desire. Um, mm -hmm. So these two passions create a kind of stalemate. If you've ever struggled with just profound um, dissatisfaction, you know that at first it, it feels like it, that dissatisfaction makes you angry or whatever, but eventually it just slows you down, the wheels kind of congeal, and you just kind of stop because you can't actually change your circumstances in the way you want to change it. And that's despondency. Despondency is that stalemate. <clears throat> now, he said despondency was one of the most serious or deadly of the passions. He believed it could lead to suicide in the same way that maybe our modern concept of depression can. Um, but the, the problem is, or I mean, revealing thing is, Evagrius, Evagrius called uh, pretty much all the passions the most deadly of the passions. So if he's, de if he's describing anger, he's like, this is the most serious passion, you know? But I, I, for a while I thought, do you not remember? This is inconsistent. But um, then I realized, you know what? These are all deadly. So, so what is it, um, what are you really saying when something is the most deadly passion? You're saying this is serious. Like the spiritual life is serious. These sicknesses are serious. And there's not a better sin or a worse sin, right? Because they're all deadly. So what I want to do now is uh, I started this talk with a quote about how despondency was the most temporal passion. I've now kind of given you a hint into my analysis of this spiritual sickness that I unpack in greater detail in the book. But now I want to really ask, like, is despondency the most temporal passion? And to do that, we have to, we have to first ask ourselves, well, how does time function in, um, how does time affect all of the rest of the passions or this, the spiritual life in general? So what I'm going to do is sort of comb through Evagrius's treatise, The Practicos, and look at how he, um, the ways that sort of temporality interact in his understanding of the passions. Now, this is my analysis. Evagrius isn't, you know, making these claims about time and the passions. I just want to be clear on that. But I've, I've kind of read his work through that lens. And I want to point out three um, temporal characteristics of all of these eight deadly thoughts. Um, actually, the third characteristic only applies to a few of them, but the first two apply to all of the thoughts. All of the eight deadly thoughts are temporal, and they're temporal in a few key ways. First of all, they're temporal in the sense that they're impermanent or transitory. And they're impermanent because Evagrius, for two reasons, Evagrius believed you could conquer the passions. So he's, that's why he's writing all of his treatises, is he believes you can reach a state of apathia. But to do that, you need some practical skills. Um, and you need some hard work. So that's one sense in which they're temporary. The second sense in which they're temporary is that even if you personally do not conquer your passions, Christ will. These passions are not going to follow us into eternity because Christ has conquered death and he's conquered sin. And I have a, a really nice quotation from here in the Practicos. He says, as regards the passion, the time will come when they will be entirely destroyed. And he's talking about the, the, uh, their fate in Christ, I guess, ultimately. The passions are temporal also in the sense that each thought, each logismos, has a unique temporal course. It has a beginning, middle, and the end, just like any cancer, you know, cancer today, we split into these stages. Well, the passions too have a certain way of behaving and growing and diminishing in time. His, Evagrius's writing is replete with describing the, the courses of the different passions. So I'm going to share an example with you, but just note it's one of like countless um, examples where you can find this kind of language. So he's talking about anger. And he is splitting the attack of anger, or the, the life of anger as a passion into three phases. He says, above all, at the time of prayer, anger seizes the mind and flashes the picture of the offensive person before one's eyes. Then there comes a time when it persists longer, is transformed into indignation, stirs up alarming experiences by night. So those are the first two stages. Then he says, this is succeeded by a general debility of the body, 
malnutrition with its attendant pallor, and the illusion of being attacked by poisonous wild beasts. So that's the last stage of anger. I don't, I don't want to know what comes after that. <laughs> we already got wild beasts on the scene. All right, so and then he says these four last mentioned consequences, and I think I counted it out, it seemed like, from this stage to the end. Um, these four last mentioned consequences following upon indignation may be found to accompany many thoughts. So, you know, he's saying that, at least in this example where he's talking about all passions kind of end in the same place, which is lunacy and death. Um, personally, I have never felt that I'm being attacked by poisonous wild beasts, but um, he's addressing monastics, and these monastics had, had very intense, intense uh, and vivid spiritual you know, warfare and struggles that they were going through. So I've talked about uh, two of the temporal characteristics of the thoughts. Here's a third one. And this, uh, this is the, the one that doesn't apply to all eight. Although I think you could stretch it to apply. Anyway, I'm just going to talk about three. So the third way that, that the passions are temporal is that some passions directly warp our perception of time. Avarice as Evagrius describes it, when you read it, you can't help but be struck, struck by the fact that avarice involves an anxiety towards the future. Almost all of the examples Evagrius gives in the Practicos, in his initial definition of avarice, have something to do with the future. So he writes that avarice uh, suggests to the mind a lengthy old age, inability to perform manual labor at some future date, and famines that are sure to come. And it's out of this anxiety or sort of sense of scarcity that you kind of uh, develop this greed. Well, if I, if I start storing up my wealth now, I'll be able to pay someone to take care of me or you know, pay, pay for a fancy barn to put all my crops in so I don't have to suffer the famine. That's avarice. Sadness, on the other hand, taints our view of the past. Drenching in sadness the memory of one's former life, which cannot be had in reality. Remember, he's talking to monastics who've left their former life, and he's speaking particularly to the temptation to reimagine that former life with tears and wanting to go back, but you can't because you've taken on this vow. But I think it's, it's useful for us as well. If you think about the times you've been sad, it often does um, have to do with a kind of nostalgia of sorts, of looking back and remembering something you can't materialize anymore or have in the same way you experienced it in the past. And even when you're sad about something in the future, it often is, um, it's often uh, the underlying pain is about a past memory. So if you're sad that you'll never be able to see a dead loved one again, well, you're remembering your past memories with that person and you're, you're actually sad that you can't go back to those times and have those times with, with that person. Likewise, uh, despondency warps our perception, both of the past and future. It's a bit more complicated. You can read the book. It also, and I would arguably say that most of all, it affects our view of the present, um, making it seem that the sun barely moves, if at all, and that the day is 50 hours long. It's really interesting to read Evagrius's descriptions of despondency because in almost all of them, something comes up about the monk's experience of time being too slow or too long. Um, so he, this is, this is one example where the, the monk is just kind of watching the sun, waiting for it to move, and it's not moving, and that prompts this kind of ennui or restlessness um, that you know you can't can't get out of your present moment in, in time, no matter how hard you try. Are there any questions so far? Or I keep going. Okay. So those are three sort of just general ways that the passions interact with time. I want to point out just some other points in which. A, sen a certain sense of temporality becomes evident in this treatise by Evagrius. And, and first I want to point out what I call the Kairos time of spiritual attacks. Who's, have we all heard of Kairos, Kairos time? Okay, so, so Kairos is 
is obviously in the New Testament, this concept of time, it's time as opportunity, where chronos is the, the Greek word chronos is um, sort of just the chronology of time, the status quo mode of time, what time does when you don't do anything with it, when God doesn't intervene. Keros moments, on the other hand, sort of punctuate chronos, and we usually associate these with God's interruption of earthly time through salvific events like the incarnation, like the Annunciation. But when you read Evagrius's treatise, um, what becomes evident is that the moment of passions, too, represent a kind of keros. Why? Because they give us an opportunity. I said before that when a thought occurs to you, that's not a sin. It's, a, it's at worst a neutral event. And um, in some cases, it's, it's actually a good event, but I'll, I'll wait for that example later. But it's at worst a neutral event. It's what you do with that thought. It's how or whether you cooperate with that thought that turns it from a neutral thought into a good and healing experience. For example, if you turn away from the thought and turn to Christ, um, that's a good and healing experience. Likewise, if you turn towards the thought and cooperate with it and build yourself around that thought, you will begin to experience death. And so, um, so this is an opportunity for us. Uh, you often find formulas or ways of speaking in Evagrius where he'll talk about the time of, in the time of sadness or in the time of anger. Uh, and it's almost like each of the passions represents in our lives a certain, a certain time um, that the spiritual life is not so much measured in days and weeks, but in the, the, the onslaught of these passions and then how we make the most of that time. So here are some examples. He says, when the soul desires to seek after a variety of foods, what passion is that? Gluttony. Gluttony. Then it is time to afflict it with bread and water, that it may learn to be grateful for a mere morsel of bread. So the opportunity here is the temptation for all these foods. What time is it? It's time to fast, basically. The next example, the time of Akivia is not the time to leave one's cell, devising plausible pretexts. Rather, stand there firmly and be patient. So when despondency attacks, you're sort of thrust into this alternate dimension of time. And it's now time not to wait for the sun to move so you can go visit your friend. <laughs> it's, it's time to get serious and uh, stay, where you, stay where you are and do the thing God has given you to do. Uh, next, next example. When you're tempted, and the, the context of this was anger. So I put especially by anger in brackets. When you're tempted, especially by anger, do not fall immediately to prayer. First, utter some angry words against the demon who afflicts you. So not, not angry words against the person you're offended by, but against the demon who's taunting you with these thoughts of anger. Okay. I thought that was, that's some surprising... <laughs> Stop fighting, guys. <laughs> Talk to your demons, not, don't, don't take it out on each other. Okay. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a surprising bit of advice because you think of when you're, when you're suddenly wrestling with a temptation, you think, oh, I should pray. He's saying, don't, don't pray, and it, especially when the temptation is anger. It's not actually time to pray. It's time to get the anger out of your system, attack the demon back. Um, he has a whole treatise called uh, about anti-racist, not racist, anti redicos is the name of the, of the treatise, and it's about countering like how to talk back to the passions. Um, so you have to talk back to your passion, get the anger out of your system a little bit, then it's time to pray. It's really interesting, I think, counterintuitive here. This quote uh, speaks again to the opportunity that passions provide for us. He says, in afflictions be especially thankful because through them you will perceive more clearly the grace of assistance. When the demon of despondency has cracked the whip of your flat against your flesh, it will be found to provide you with the greatest reward if you accept the blow as a pretext for thanksgiving. I don't think we 
often think about passions as giving us these opportunities. This is actually a really good opportunity to have. It's not an opportunity we would have without temptation. Um, this is important to remember, particularly in the context of passions. As I said, passions are like, can become these ingrained, almost addictive forms of thought in your head. And, and that often translate to habitual actions as well and reactions. And often then we, we, we set out on a course, we say, we're not going to, we're going to conquer this thing, right? Um, not always, I mean, to, to better or, or, or worse, uh, with better or worse methods, we set out to conquer our passions, right? And then almost as soon as you try to do anything good, you have the same thought occur to you. And it's easy to see that thought as a sign of failure or weakness because you think, oh, that thought's occurring to me. What kind of loser am I? I'm supposed to be beyond this, whatever. But actually, um, that's that's not a bad necessarily a bad thing for that temptation to occur to you if you can see it as an opportunity. First of all, for Thanksgiving, but second of all, to just see, okay, now what? Now what do I do? It, the the battle hasn't been lost yet. And there's an interesting passage which I haven't included here, but he talks about how. Um, the demons are sort of waging war against you on a, on a, on a sin. Um, and his demonology is interesting. I, I don't, I don't want to go down that tangent, but the demons are waging war against you. And when they can't beat you uh, with a particular passion, what they'll often do, according to Evagrius, is they'll send in um, a demon that you conquered a long time ago who's been kind of lying dormant. And they'll send him in because they know you struggled with him. You, you struggled really hard to get that demon under control in the past. So they'll send him in and hope that because you haven't been paying attention, because you haven't been struggling as intensely with this demon, that he'll find a, a point of weakness. And he, he says something like, if that happens, or if you find yourself struggling with something you beat a long time ago, that's a sign of your strength. Because they're having to sort of attack you through this this old way and, and find your old weakness. Um, and it reminded me of when I was entering graduate school and you have to take the LSATs and all of that. It's because it's all on computer now. It's, um, I forgot the word, like it's self, basically when you, you can tell when you're getting questions right because the questions keep getting harder. Uh, but as soon as you get a really easy question after a hard question, you know you got the last question wrong because, <laughs> because like it, it recognized that you were wrong, you couldn't handle the heat, so it's got to now start you back on level one and build you back up. It's, they're trying to find like at what um, level your, your skills deteriorate. Um, so you can, you know, it's, it plays mind games with you. But, <laughs> but the spiritual life is a little bit maybe similar sometimes where you're struggling really hard against something and you, you suddenly have this, this temptation that comes out of nowhere. I thought I dealt with this. Well, this is a sign you're getting a harder question, you know? It's interesting to think about. Okay. Uh, now, just as there's kind of a, a temporality involved with the passions, there's also a time for apathia. Apathia for Evagrius is the core of spiritual health. He says we call, the, we call apathia the health of the soul. And uh, what this kind of consists of is, I mean, among other things, it's a kind of a complex topic in and of itself, but this requires curtailing the duration of time that the passions hold sway within us. So, so there's this beautiful quote here. He says, it is not in our power to determine whether we are disturbed by these evil thoughts, but it is up to us to decide if they are to linger within us. So the thoughts are going, as I've said before, they're going to occur to us no matter what. What we can, I don't want to say control, but what we have some degree of free will over is how long they last. If we cooperate with them, if we start listening to them, if we start inviting them into our minds and our hearts, they're going to last a lot longer. And the longer they last, the harder they're going to be to, to rid ourselves of. Apathia is really a kind of telling time. It involves learning to discern what time it is, not according to the clock or sun or even the liturgical calendar, but according to the dynamic unfolding of one's soul towards God. And I have a, a few quotes to kind of think about in this context. Um, this is probably one of my favorite quotes from Evagrius. He writes, all practices, and he's talking specifically about healing practices. 
All practices are to be engaged in according to due measure at the appropriate times. What is untimely done or done without measure endures but a short time, and what is short-lived is more harmful than profitable. So, um, so you have to, you know, apply, he has many sort of antidotes to the passions, and you have to apply these things at the right time. You can't just say, well, go pray. As we just saw, sometimes in certain passions, it's not the right time to pray. So you have to apply what is timely for each passion. And you have to do that in a consistent, long-lasting way, not just sort of well, say a prayer and hope it goes away and then go on with my life. You have to be consistent here. It's another quote that I like. One must always be on the alert to seize the opportunities to fulfill all the duties possible to the best of his powers. And um, the context of this quote is he's talking to monks who periodically have to return out or go somewhere outside of the monastery for business you know, to do something or, I don't know, sell baskets or something. So they're not, they're not following the monastic life to a T. And he, just before this quote, he says something like, you can't always follow the monastic rule. But what you can do is always be alert to seize the opportunities that are available for you. The demons are not ignorant of the possibilities afforded to them on, on such occasions. Thus it happens that in their passion against us, they prevent our undertaking what is possible and constrain us to undertake things that are impossible for us. So the demons often tempt us to go beyond our measure, um, go beyond our capacity, instead of being faithful to what we can handle in the, in the present. And then finally, um, let a monk note while the complexity of his thoughts, their periodicity, the demons which cause them, with the order of their succession and the nature of their associations. Then let him ask from Christ the explanations of these data he has observed. So he's telling the monks, you know, uh, take note of your thoughts and how they behave in time, how they occur and recur, which passions follow on the other ones. It's kind of highly unique for each person. So take note of this and then take this to Christ and ask Christ, what do I do with this? Why is any of this important? I'm going to skip that quote because we're running out of time and I want to leave time for the Q&A, but why is any of this important? You might be thinking, well, yeah, of course he talks about time and passions in time because time exists and you can't really talk about things um, without acknowledging that. But I don't, I think that um, while that's true, we often try as writers or as thinkers we often try to think outside of time. Um, and I think also as human beings in the spiritual life, we're, we're often trying to get to a mode of existence where we can kind of set it and forget it, where we conquer what we need to conquer, deal with what we need to deal with, and we're going to get to this point in life where we can just relax, enjoy it, and um, wait for Christ to return. Uh, <laughs> spiritual return. Yeah. Yeah or like senioritis or something. Um, and so I, I, I often like to ask people, how much of our faith is truly lived in time? If you're like most human beings, I don't, I don't, I think most of us struggle to live our faith in time. Um, we might like to think we do better than we do, you know, that, that we've, that we've uh, made more progress than we actually have because theoretically we have, but like theoretically, I can, I theoretically, I love my neighbor, but the moment, and I talk about this in my book, the moment I have to, I'm standing in my elevator coming down from my high rise apartment. And the moment someone gets on that elevator and it has to stop and I have to wait for the doors to open and I have to wait for them to call their kids down from the hallway because their kids aren't ready yet. And then they're, they're grabbing their shopping bags and it's taking way longer than it needs to take, frankly, to just get on the elevator. The moment that happens, you know, how much do I really love that person? Um, so that's a, that's a funny example, but it happens all the time. Theoretically, we pray, but how, mon how many of us pray in time consistently um, with, you know, sort of heartfelt thanksgiving? Uh, that's, that's kind of really where the struggle lies. Thinking about the passions from the vantage point of time forces us to bridge the gap between theory and practice. When we think about passions in time, we recognize 
we can't give cookie cutter solutions. And when we're having a problem, we have to talk to someone. We have to read about it. We have to go to Christ with our struggles so that he can guide us and lead us. Um, and also with the help of pastoral counsel as to what really we need to, to counter this passion. Um, and this is just my soapbox. Is our theology an ideal or reality? Uh, they're nice questions. I just sort of tacked them onto this presentation because I think they're important. Um, what does it mean to think in time spiritually? Is our aim spiritual transformation or spiritual maintenance? That gets back to this idea of the set it and forget it spiritual retirement. Do we envision spiritual maturity as a timeless or time full mode of existence? A, a place where we can begin to understand how to live in each moment to the best of our capacity in Christ. Are our moments in this life building towards something or nothing? I don't have answers for these, but just, you know, file them away somewhere <laughs> as important. Um, anyway, so my bottom line with this whole presentation is that time exists, the passions exist, and they exist in time. So that means we're always at a crossroads. Every time a passion occurs to us, whether it's despondency um, or another passion, our choice is essentially to turn towards the passion or to turn towards Christ. And I asked at the beginning, is despondency really the most temporal passion? Because now you've seen that all passions somehow relate to time. But I think what despondency robs us of is, is even the, the gut level and foundational belief that time is even meaningful and that our participation in the present is even meaningful. And we get to this point where we, we say, maybe not across the board, but we get to these moments where we say, so what? That's To me, that's the beginning of despondency. Um, to, to begin to seize these opportunities, we have to say that, that time is important and that each moment is vital in our spiritual life. It's not, um, we never get to a point where time becomes unimportant mm -hmm. in our lives. So that is the conclusion of my talk. I will let the slides rest on this. Um, this is where the translations that I use of the sources today. And with that, I'll open the floor for questions and discussions.